that whole spiritual culture of the East um, first, like the whole yogic path and the sutras and the shastras and imagining that lifestyle of a, of a yogi. And, uh, and then that led me to the Sawuf, the Sufism also. I always felt like living, you know, in Canada and, and growing up there, I just felt, uh, you could say like disconnected. And it was hard to feel like a sense of, of home, a sense of security, a sense of inspiration. It felt like growing up in a foreign land almost. I, I did grow up in a slightly abusive family, so that also made it hard to um, hard to even be at home. So I was just naturally as you spending a lot of time like in the forest and in being on my own. That whole spiritual culture of the East um, first, like the whole yogic path and the sutras and the shastras and imagining that lifestyle of a, of a yogi. And uh, and then that led me to the Sawuf, the Sufism also, but really exploring all those different mystical and spiritual paths of the East was so inspiring to me and gave me a you know, focus and an interest and wanted to feel part of it. So yeah, I left when I was 16 I knew India through the the shastras, so I was like like the the scriptures. So I was imagining an India from you know like a thousand years ago, and I had been studying uh, Sanskrit and the whole like sannyas of that time and what that was like. So I was a bit of an antique when I got there. I didn't I didn't know Hindi, but I was like I could read and write Sanskrit and all that. You know, I went with with no money, just as like any sadhu would. I just had enough money to get on the flight and get there. And so I was very exposed to everything. Uh, I remember those first couple of days I stayed at the Gurdwara, uh, Shishganj Gurdwara in Delhi. And then um, just went north and I basically walked for three months until I got to Tibet. And you know, I pilgrimaged through like a lot of those centers, like the Panch Kedar and Badrinath, a lot of these like very old um, temples and the it was fascinating because I think in my ideal there was this whole like yogic culture there that was very austere and very pure just like as it was described in the old scriptures but then I was confronted with this kind of modern version of it you could say where you know a lot of the yogis or sadhus could be like you know ex-cons or people that were like uh, connected to more recent versions of um, Hinduism and things that I didn't relate to as much, like with the with the deities and all this. And I just imagine like people sitting in, in meditation high up in the mountain, you know, finding their oneness with the divine. But there were so many different castes and creeds and sects and different belief systems. So it was it was complex. actually five years that I was in that um, life of a darvish completely. You know, there's all the rules that you follow and one of them is is living on your own as a mendicant, meaning you can't um, have any like place of residence. So there's always that like that tra that traveling. It's very different than being in the world of humans that have, you know, they give you an association of who you are and what you are all the time. So it's very confronting to be alone like that. There was, of course, moments of, of meeting different yogis that were far in the mountains, you know, living in a little kutia, like a little hut, and doing their their practice, their, their sadhana. And that was really inspiring and beautiful to see that people can exist like that outside of the typical culture where everybody's, you know, rushing to get ahead and make money and have a big house and a car and all that. It was beautiful to see that in that five years, there was one point that I was in a cave for three months and I hadn't 
uh, any access to food. So it felt I had to just sit quietly and still in meditation to survive that long. And there, you know, there was also time of like, uh, I, a couple of times like of being poisoned. I mean, in my own, by my own fault of like, you know, eating the wrong wild uh, root or mushroom. <laughs> And then being like stung by a scorpion in the night and just all th those kind of things that happen when one's just living out in, in, in the wild and there's, you know, there's really nobody there to save you. You know, there'd be moments I remember, like, for example, I'd be like in the middle of nowhere and it'd be really cold or something. I, I just imagine like, wow, it'd be so nice just to have a, like a big blanket right now or a light that I could turn on or or like a, a bowl of fruit, you know, just imagine, cause it's, yeah. You imagine that world where you just go to a grocery store and, and buy food or go home and sleep in a bed. And and yeah, there was fleeting moments, but I did understand even at that time, all the, all the commitment, all the responsibility, all the karma that goes with that. So I remember thinking like, no, Tahir, you don't want to go back and have to, you know, deal with your family or or like have some kind of profession to be able to live in that way it's not worth it look where you are like in the, in the himalayas look how beautiful it is the fresh air and and all the life around it's not like a city with bustling frustrated people mm -hmm.